We are doing a deep dive into the future of copper that any retail investor can relate to here on StansburyInvestor.com today. Uh, joining me for this very special copper uh, edition is Jani Kovacevic. He's the CEO of Copper Bank. Uh, basically, it offers a unique pounds in the ground copper investment vehicle. And we also have Vince Sarache. He is the CEO of uh, Kucho Copper, it's basically a Canadian resource development company focused on expanding and developing a high-grade copper zinc project in northern British Columbia. Uh, gentlemen, a welcome both uh, to this copper special. Thank you for taking part in it. Greetings from Zagreb, Daniela, and so nice. Very timely, I think, to talk about these data points. Thank it, you. Indeed. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Vince, as well, uh, joining us from, uh, from Vancouver, I assume. Yes, and thank you for having us as well, Daniela. Pleasure uh, to be here. Absolutely. Well, look, I don't have to tell you guys about the buzz surrounding copper. Um, you know, obviously the metal hitting uh, a 10 year high uh, last month. It's it's on its way to resuming these highs right now, mostly thanks to um, the U.S. stimulus bill. We have benign U.S. inflation data and we have better than expected uh, Chinese lending numbers. Um, but I just want to first get your take surrounding uh, the energy we're feeling right now in the copper space. Johnny, do you want to kick us off? Well, I've been following this sector for 25 years. As you know, Daniela, we know each other very uh, long quite a while. <laughs> and I've had this, you know, I was on Bloomberg when I did my book tour and talking about the decoupling of incumbent energy to modern energy. And when we're talking about this Green New Deal or renewable energy, all these things that you're hearing about today it's actually electrification. And the greener and cleaner that we generate, transfer, and utilize energy, the more that is demanded of copper. From 1890 to today, copper has continued to be 20% of final energy usage. That's now going into hyperdrive. And in the next 25 years or so, it will be 50, 50% of final energy usage. What does that mean for investors? We will require as much copper as we installed in the last 130 years, and that's gonna be compressed into the next two decades. So yeah. where will the copper come from? Unfortunately, the days of 2% copper are over. They invested, the majors, uh, over $100 billion over the China super cycle. We got a lot of data, and I read these reports like Harlequin Romance. And there's a punchline here, and that's what we're going to talk about today, the results of all that data. Where are we going? All right, we're, we're going to get there. I just want to get uh, Vince's take as uh, how copper uh, could really become king here on the on the road towards electrification. It is. And, you know, just to echo some of uh, Johnny's uh, remarks, um, you know, we are amidst a green revolution. Um, it's, it's, it's been creeping up on us. It's in front of us. It's going to be a big push here in the future. And as Johnny said, you know, copper is a, is a major contributor to that on the demand side. Um, you know, with this, with this massive push we're seeing in decarbonization, the move away from fossil fuels uh, like coal and oil, um, that, that push then moves into um, boosting the demand for uh, or the requirements for renewable energy generation, that infrastructure, wind, solar, batteries, all the EVs, all that stuff that will reduce the carbon footprints and emissions, um, you know, requires a lot more copper uh, to, to achieve that. Now, let me ask you, and, and please help educate uh, me on this. You know, obviously, when we talk about electrification and EVs, we're talking cobalt, lithium, uh, silver. A lot of talk about silver, um, but do you both feel that copper um, is the most important metal when we're talking electrification? Well, it's a, it's a metal that's going to have a uh, middle, middle road scenario, 6% CAGR growth rate for the rest of this decade. And of the big commodities, I, I don't think of any other um, of the big bulks that's going to have that kind of growth. Why? When you build a conventional megawatt of thermal electrical power, it takes rule of thumb about one ton per megawatt, rule of thumb. When you build offshore wind power, Daniela, it's 10 tons, 10 or 11 tons per megawatt. This is 10x more copper. Now, and they're building offshore wind parks at the gigawatt scale. And yeah. this happens with solar power, it happens with, with the 
electric vehicles, that's 400% more copper for each one vehicle. So even if the automotive industry is compressed because of uh, consumer behavior and people staying at home and not driving as much and young people not wanting to buy cars, the copper industry doesn't care yeah. because even if car sales go down by 10 or 20% in aggregate, when 30% of, of, of these cars that are made are electric in the late 2020s, the industry will use way more copper. Then they have to build the chargers. And then they have to create more electricity because it cannot be coal. It has to be something greener and cleaner to fuel these vehicles for the, for the rest of our lives. You, it's not recycled. Kager growth rate, 6%, middle of the road. Really well said, uh, Johnny. And, and Vince, maybe you can shed some light on, on the sub supply side, because from what I understand, uh, before the China super cycle, there was easily uh, you know, double the amount of copper mines. Uh, you know, what's the situation like today? You know, the, the, the copper mining industry is in a bit of a paradox right now. Mm. Um, you've got a limited supply of new copper projects coming online. Uh, you've got, and this, this goes across you know, the entire mining industry right now, but, you know, we're, 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 copper isn't any different. Um, you know, there's difficulties in advancing new projects. You've got, um, you know, social and permitting ESG has become, you know, it's, it's in the forefront. Um, you know, this, the social license is so important these days. Um, and, you know, in jurisdictions where, you know, I guess it was a little e easier to navigate in the past, South American stuff. No, it's just as important, even, even in a uh, less structured environment that maybe we see here in BC, um, it, it's still exceptionally important and it's in the forefront now. So, you know, you've got to deal with the, all of this. That's time, that's money. Uh, you've got costs increasing across the board, exponentially across you know the planet, and, uh, with respect to mining and, and a lot of other things. And you know, with copper mines, unlike gold mines, the big copper mines that move the needle uh, on the supply side, these things are multi-billion-dollar capexes. These things take 20 years uh, by the time they're discovered, or longer uh, by the time they're discovered to permit. Um, so you know, you, you've got you've got all these kind of bottlenecks occurring. And as Johnny was referring to, yeah. you know, demand side is increasing exponentially. The supply side is not going to necessarily catch up anytime soon, let's say. Um, and then, you know, another bit you've got, as you said uh, as well too, about grade, um, you know, these existing projects, um, grade curves are declining significantly uh, at, at alongside costs increasing. So, there's a lot of factors out there um, in, in the industry itself um, that are going to continue to be problematic. I, I find that fascinating, your, your comparison to mining you know, gold and silver, which is obviously an environment I'm very familiar with. Um, could, Vince, could you just shed a little bit more light? So from what I'm hearing from you, copper is more difficult to mine than gold and silver? Is it more costly, difficult to find? What are, what are the hurdles? It's, it's, more, to, it's yeah. actually more common uh, okay. out there than some of the precious metals, but it's, it's usually in a more um, bulk scenario. So you've got, you know, and, and gold, listen, gold can be caught like uh, be in that scenario, but gold, um, more of the high grade projects um, don't uh, necessarily require as big capital on some of these smaller high grade projects. Throughput might be a little less. The costs from a, a capital perspective um, could be a little less, and and uh, but you know copper usually, I, and again the projects that move the needle uh, with respect to the demand side of the planet are these big bulk tonnage type projects, um, and these big you know you know uh, multi. Um, uh, these big bulk tonnage projects, I'll try to keep it simple, um, simply require a lot more capital to build, um, require a lot more infrastructure to build. Um, and when you're, and literally, I mean, these, these big projects can cost $2 billion, $3 billion, $4 billion, $5 billion to build. Um, and, and that's a lot of capital uh, that, you know, is these days, is a little more risk adverse. So they're not jumping at these opportunities as they were back in say 2011 and stuff like that. Um, so it's just, it, these are just roadblocks and speed bumps to getting this stuff done quickly. So 
if it's hard to come by a, a copper and to get it out of the ground, Johnny, can you paint a picture with, you know, the, the situation here in the US, the Biden administration focusing on the Green New Deal. So, you know, how much copper do you think we're going to need to meet all these initiatives? Okay, I'm going to paint you a tapestry here. Get your pencils Beautiful. out, everyone. The data is very important. And I think to, to talk about where we're going. The, the demand of copper today is 25 million tons, plus or minus. And we're gonna be growing at about 6% CAGR growth rate. We grew at three and a half percent for 120 years growth. Copper always grew with population growth. That's gonna go parabolic here. Over a million tons a year more we require. There are half of the companies that we used to have during the China super cycle, lots of M&A. So I speak to those 13, 14 CEOs of major copper mining companies, where are they building their current projects? There are about 21, 22 projects being built right now. Kazakhstan, Russia, Peru, Chile, Serbia, Congo. Where's the future of copper mining? They have four choices, Daniela, these CEOs, because business is going to be very good, but they, it's geologically rare. They need to go to higher elevation, 4,000, 5,000 meters. I'm talking Peru, Chile. They need to go to places that do not have long standing copper mining culture. Pakistan, Afghanistan, other uh, back to Bougainville, those places. Do they have the risk tolerance for that? Or they're going to have to go to historical copper mining camps like Arizona, Australia, British Columbia, Quebec. And the fourth one, which is, which is a very difficult one, is to go find new deposits. They're, that's hard because it takes 20 years from discovery hole to the bankable feasibility study. They don't have the time. They need to acquire projects that are at year 15 in that cycle. And that's exactly what I believe they're gonna do. Vince, do you agree with that? You're obviously based in BC. Do you agree that we're gonna have to go start exploring in these other countries? It's, you know, listen, uh, the, the everything that you you used to be able to trip over, it's gone in, 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 you know, let's say North America and some of the more prolific districts. That's gone. That's been found. Um, so now you're starting to move and you need to move uh, into a few, I guess, different philosophies. You're either spending a lot more money in exploration, looking, use, looking for stuff that, you know, is undiscovered, that wasn't cropping out of the ground, that may be deeper and undercover. I'm sure there's a bunch of that out there, but that's not easy to find. Or you're moving into some of these jurisdictions that, that Johnny mentioned that, you know, maybe people were a little, uh, you know, tentative to move into in the past. So I'm going to give you a couple more data points, Daniela, which I think will really help. Please. Um, two parts of the business, building it and finding it, talking about copper resources. Of these 21 projects that these companies are building, the, the collective CapEx is $65 billion, which will give a, a metal yield of 3,300,000 tons. Mm -hmm. A few things to glean out of here. This is not gonna cut the mustard and we're growing at a million and a half tons a year in demand off that 25 million ton base. So they're gonna have to increase the amplitude. We also know that there's something called a CapEx per ton of production. So if you take the CapEx divided by that metal yield, it's now $20,000 per ton of production. Or to put it in a more understandable way, for every 100,000 tons of metal yield that they're, they're hoping to get, there's a 2 billion of CapEx based on 21 projects currently being built with tens of millions of dollars of drilling and data that went into to, to find them. So it's ruinously expensive, this business. The future is even more, but now finding the copper, we know because they spent tens of billions of dollars drilling and looking for copper during the China super cycle. It now takes to find a measured and indicated pound in the ground, four cents. So if you're looking for a 10 billion pound copper porphyry with misses and drilling and, and working and 15 years of cycle, $400 million on average to find a 10 billion pound deposit. It's no wonder that during the, that, that cycle, the, there's 30 takeovers. They were paying between three and 10 cents per established pound in the ground. And I believe they will be doing more than that this, this go around because the copper price is going to be higher. Business is going to be better. They already went around the world looking for things and they know it's going to cost 
four cents a pound anyways. These companies are trading, Copper Bank trades at one half of one penny per established pound in the ground. And that's something we'll talk about later, but there is a huge delta of opportunity uh, in this space it, it com combined with a lot of, how shall I say this politely, um, ignorance. People simply do not care in the, in, the, in the macro energy sphere about copper. It doesn't even get mentioned. You know, the last three years at Dan Jurgen Sarah week, Copper didn't get a line item. It's the, it's the Achilles heel. And I had breakfast with Richard Ackerson in Arizona 18 months ago. And I said, Richard, you, you need to go there. You know, Dan Jurgen, and explain to these guys how difficult this is. And they cannot rely on this. Well, the time you know, is turning. Copper, it's going to take a much, much higher copper price. And I, and I, and I want to ask Vince how life has changed for him as a copper mining CEO. You know, has it been easier to acquire financing to move things along now that copper um, is set to become a star here? Instrumentally, so um, you know, like like anything in in the markets, ir irrespective of what it is, and it, whether it's gold or copper, you know, you always need you need the sentiment behind you. You need a little wind in your sail, if you will. And you know, when we when we acquired our asset back in two thousand end of two thousand seventeen. And uh, immediately after that, the, uh, the trade war between the U.S. and China emerged. Well, that had big potential economic concerns. And, you know, Dr. Copper, the bellwether of, you know, the economy, um, wasn't um, in flavor for the next few years because of that potential risk. Um, and then um, just pre-COVID, uh, you know, when they solved that issue, well, COVID came about and, you know, the next three months were rocky for everybody. But, um, Yes. Now, since, say, the middle of last year, um, you know, copper's in flavor. We saw price appreciation, obviously, and it's, it's changed the landscape. Um, now for, you know, copper exploration, copper developers, copper producers, um, you've seen a significant lift. Um, and, uh, you know, the sentiment out there has shifted. So there's money available. Um, there's much, uh, you know, many more interested uh, parties uh, interested in participating on the equity side or the debt side or whatever it might take in the industry. I guess just to wrap here, uh, um, gentlemen, you know, obviously investors are watching and if they're, they're looking to add uh, copper to their portfolio, um, you know, what are some things they should be thinking about and how to go about that? Johnny? Well, I would, I would look at companies that are aligned with shareholders and you can now go back in time and historically look at how did companies survive how did they raise capital? And for Copper Bank, I'm the largest shareholder. Frank Holmes and myself were the number one and two. We had three criteria. We bought projects in the teeth of the bear market. They needed to be projects, three criteria. One, our children have to be able to work at these projects. That's our risk tolerance. Number two, they had to have, you know, real capital had already allocated to delineate them to a certain point. I, I've already articulated the right year sort of 15 down that 20 year arc. And most importantly, Daniela, I'm not building a copper mine. I'm the custodian. Will a, a larger company to take over this project from me because it has all those other attributes and, 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 and properties? Copper Bank is optionality, copper price and land. It's also development exposure. We've got two advanced stage projects, one located in Arizona, one located in Nevada, and we have three very exciting, I would say, blue sky exploration uh, projects associated with these other two and we have a built-in royalty company so it's a it's a bit of a one-stop shop you get exposure to the industry the various different um, uh, right. attributes and I think we're also fully aligned with our shareholders we are owner operators and demonstrated that by doing all of our capital raises without issuing warrants always above the market and we own everything hundred percent so now we need to spend a little bit of capital to take these things and move the chains forward and we'll see where the ball, where, 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 where they fall. But the, the valuation, just to, to wrap up my part on our historical studies, Copper Creek um, in all categories has 8 billion pounds measured, indicated, inferred, and people have to look at our uh, verbiage on our website about that and look at what does it cost to delineate that kind of a resource? And is our location going to be somewhere that someone's going to want to come in and do the last mile. We're, we're speculating that, that that's exactly gonna be the case. Vince, I'll give you the last word. Uh, I guess, 
you know, obviously you're the CEO of Kucha Copper Mining Company, but um, you know, if I were to ask you to answer this question as Vince, uh, the copper investor, um, you know, what are what is some advice or things that you think is really important to look at when investing in copper? Sure, and you know, as a closing note to and and you know, try to I guess you know keep this high level uh, for for people um, with respect to you know, again, a little on the future. You know, the stage is set here. We we've talked about a lot about what's going on and and how it will impact the future, et cetera, et cetera. But if you really want to dumb it down, and uh, you know, listen, there's I'm 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 not an analyst, and and uh, but you know, you can look at we've talked about why copper is going to be in demand and um, and, uh, and infrastructure uh, or the spending with respect to the electrification of everything. But you know, one thing we should pay attention to is that you know. Back in March, April, May, when copper was down about two bucks, we made it move to three bucks. That was because China came out of their COVID situation very quickly. And they threw $500, $600 million at infrastructure spending to try to fix that economic hole or problem that they had during COVID. Copper moved up to three bucks pretty quick. So copper, copper moves very quickly with respect to the economies or spending to, to fix economies. So let's think about that. That was uh, that was China, and they are the biggest consumer of copper in the world. Okay, but they threw a bunch of money at fixing their problem. Copper, basically, what we haven't seen happen yet, and the, you know, the U.S. is wanting to still push through a multi-trillion-dollar long-term economic program. We have a lot of permanent job loss in front of us because of COVID, um, and they're still going to fix that. The U.S. is going to fix that. Europe's going to fix that. We haven't even come out. This, this global economic recovery is still to come. You know, we're still, we're just coming out of it. So you've got the US, you've got Europe, all these guys are going to be throwing a whole bunch of money to replace jobs. That's infrastructure spending. And relating to what we were talking about earlier, now the key to infrastructure spending is more towards the electrification of things. You know, classic bridges, roads, wires in the sky, that's great. But now they're going to be focused on throwing this infrastructure money at renewables, at EVs, at stuff with respect to decarbonization and everything that we've been talking about. So, you know, you had copper back in 2011, trade at 463, 465, I believe was the high. Um, you know, we're sitting around four bucks. Well, I would suggest that the stage of the backdrop that we're in right now will basically support a much, has much stronger catalysts than what we even saw back 10, 12 years ago that propelled copper to its high at that time. We've got all the banks, JP Morgan, Goldman, Bank of America saying we're in a new commodity super cycle. So there's a lot of support in the narratives there to support that as well. So, you know, you can think of it from that perspective. And then, you know, at this point, yeah, the leverage as far as investing goes um, and getting exposure to copper, you know, listen, uh, it depends on people's risk tolerances. Uh, you know, you can invest in some of the, the, the producers as they are now. I'm sure there's going to be some more upside there, but you want the best leverage. Find yourself some good junior explorers, um, some good junior developers, uh, you know, and, you know, uh, as far as Cucho is concerned, you know, we're, uh, we're a development stage project. We're a high grade project. We talked about grade. Well, you know, Cucho in its, um, in its last PFS, uh, we were just under 3% copper equivalent. So we, we are a high grade, a high margin deposit. We're just wrapping up our feasibility study here. That'll be in June. You know, the feasibility study essentially is the kind of uh, a very significant de-risk point of a project. Now you're talking about financing and moving towards production. We're already down part of the path with respect to permitting. Um, and, you know, something like Cucho currently trading at a, um, you know, $40 million market cap or maybe a 0.15 times P to NAB is the ratio people like to use for development stage projects in an environment right now where those assets would be trading around a 0.3 Point four because we were just in that environment right now. Um, so I would suggest projects like Cucho um, and others um, are that gives you your really good leverage on exposure to copper, you know, as long as your risk tolerances are there. Thank you, Vince. Uh, best of luck, continued success. And Jani, uh, same to you. Thank you both for joining me for this copper special here on stansberryinvestor.com. Thank you for having us, Daniela. Thanks, Go Daniela. copper, right? <laughs> uh, thank you both. And thank you for watching. We'll have much more for you. So be sure to stay tuned. Stansberryinvestor.com. Thanks for watching. I'm Daniela Kimball.